Um, Kimberly Veal is the uh, president of and uh, a, a founder of Pre People of Color Beyond Faith, whose mission is to bridge the gap between the secular and religious communities. She's also host of the Black Freethinkers podcast. Uh, Kim's background is in information technology, and she is working to develop IT resources in underdeveloped communities and believes that access to technology can encourage and motivate young people to utilize their talents to create opportunities. She has focused her efforts on moving social justice in the secular community. I'd like to introduce Kimberly Veal. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So again, I'm Kimberly Veal. Um, I'm the host of the Black Free Thinkers podcast. Our motto is, we are here to encourage you and to challenge you to think and live for yourself. And that's extremely important. Critical thinking skills are not taught in our schools anymore, and in many cases, it's discouraged. So I like to describe myself as a nonconformist. I've been a nonconformist since day one. My mother was supposed to give birth to me in December, had her doctor give me a five-day notice, and I still waited for another two weeks, just <laughs> because I could. And, you know, it's been like that from day one until today. So it's been really interesting. Um, when I put together my talk, I didn't put anything about myself in the talk. So when I heard the other speakers, I said, well, maybe I need to give them some information about me to give you some context so that you can understand the journey that I've been on. My mother will tell you, it started all when she allowed me to take those gifted classes. <laughs> and what happened was, you know, they had 11, 12 year olds running around high school, choosing their own high school classes, taking some college courses. And I decided to take up world religion, comparative religion. Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> And so I'm sitting there and I'm reading this and I'm like, who is this person that they speak of? It's like the first time you read or hear about Netsky and you're like, ooh, why are you saying such things? You know, it's like, where is this coming from? You go home. I went home, started asking questions. And of course, my mother did not appreciate that. She did not like it. I was only in that program for one year. And so she snatched me out, but it was okay. It was okay, but what it did was it taught me about these different religions, about these different schools of thought that were out there. And what it does, it encouraged me to research, to learn, to read, and find out about other people. It also encouraged me to reach out to people of other ethnicities, nationalities, and get to know about them and what they believe in and what they don't believe in and why. And so I started the podcast in 2011. It's been a journey. I believe I was 10, 15 years ahead of my time. However, you know, the archives are still up and I put that out there because I want people to be able to go back to the archives and see what we were talking about and even the changes that have happened to me. You know, uh, people change. When you know better, you do better. So when someone challenges me about something that I said in 2012 or 2013, and I say, well, look at the progress I've made. Look at what I'm saying now in 2018. Isn't that what's important? And I don't edit the shows because I want people to see things like, at the beginning of the show, I pronounced the word correctly, but by the end of the show, I've raged on so much that you know, I've turned it into a totally different word. But that is letting people know that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay not to know something. It's okay to reach out. It's okay sometimes to start over. It shows that you're human. Being in this community, in the secular community, what has happened is it actually made me more compassionate. It made me more understanding. It made me want to reach out to people even more and try to reconcile whatever differences that we may have. And one of the things that I always tell people is that I feel as though we have more in common than in differences. And so what would happen is when I was a believer, when someone would do something, you know, I would just cut them off. It wasn't so much compassion because why? You're a sinner, that's why. So, you know, but as you know, a free thinker, a humanist, an atheist, what I've had to do and what I've had to learn is go back and look at the situation because I'm one of these people, I am not an anti-theist. I believe that we can work with the church and through the church 
to achieve some common ground, some common um, issues that we share, you know, the community. And it's important to do that because what I try to explain to people and get them to understand is that in the black community, in black and brown communities, the church is the focal point of the community. So it's like trying to throw out the entire culture and that's never going to work. And so while we're out here and we're talking to people about their religion, there's a way to engage them without putting them on the offense all the time, or putting them on the defense all of the time. And by asking these questions, by being kind, by being respectful, by allowing them to have their dignity and, and, and acknowledging their humanity, we're able to have these difficult conversations. And so when I hear some atheists out here and they want to do away with the church, and I'm one of the people who will fight it, so they call me an apologist, which is fine. But what happens is I need for them to understand in the black community, when something was going wrong or you needed some information, you go to the church. When you run out of food and you still have a week to go and you have to feed your children, there is a church in a neighborhood that can give you some groceries or one of the church people who may go into their house and take some things out of their freezer or cook for you, whatever the situation may be, if you need some help with your utility bills. It's just a number of dif different services that are offered through the church. So if you want to do away with the church, what are we as the secular community doing to replace the services that we're trying to kick out of the community? And this is one of the reasons why I've, I've railed against faith-based initiatives. I've also railed against what the Republicans are trying to trick religious people into believing. They want to basically take all of the social safety net off of the federal role or registry and push it out to the church, to the churches. They are not equipped to deal with these services. So what will happen is, again, we will have corruption because of the money. You will have people out here not giving the services to the people, and they will call it a failure, and then they will do away with the entire social safety net. And that's, that's dangerous. Because then what will happen? I believe anarchy will fall into place. And then what? How do we deal with that? How do we get that under control. So this is one of the reasons why I tell secular people, you know, you really need to think out those arguments and to have a better understanding as to the impact that it can and will have, especially on underserved communities. You know, it's extremely important for that. It's just interesting because when I was younger, <laughs> in high school, I went to my mom's job one day to pick her up and her manager was sitting there talking to her. So of course they were talking about religion. And the manager turned to me to ask me my opinion. And my mom looked real nervous. <laughs> because I said that I'm more of a deist. I knew that saying atheist was a bad word, so I knew better than to say that. But I said I was more of a deist. I believe that there may be a supernatural being, but he doesn't care what we're doing down here. <laughs> And the manager just gave me this big smile, and my mom was pushing me out the door. But later on, when my mom went back to work, the manager told her, she said, your daughter is very special. You need to keep an eye on her. <laughs> now, I'm not quite sure how to take it, but you know, my mom took it as a compliment, all right? And so, and so it's just really interesting, because as I was growing up, I would ask questions in church. Because at first, it was like a play date. You go every Sunday, you get to play with your friends, hang out, go to the store, and then all of a sudden they want you to pay attention. Well, you don't necessarily want a gifted child that <laughs> paying attention because it turns into why. Why this, why that? Well, wouldn't it be easier for him to just convert Satan? And we get it up. <laughs> you know, but you know, that's my logic and Next thing I know, I'm being talked about and being gaslighted all over the place. So when I came to this community, it felt like home. And so, <laughs> so it was just really interesting going through all of that. So as time has gone on, one of the things that I learned about, you know, and again, I was raised in a religious household. My mom is a minister. 
So, and I used to be a minister, and when I was around 11, 12, when I took that comparative religion class, I started questioning a whole bunch of things I probably should not have been questioning, but that is what started that particular journey. And so what happens is when you have a child like that, that's there and asking these questions, the other kids listen. So then they begin to isolate you and they're like, oh, you don't have to pay attention anymore. <laughs> you just go on and find something else to do. But while in church, I learned about social justice. I learned about outreach to the community, outreach to people, outreach to people who don't even know that they need help. You know, and also with the podcast, I share my experience. I would have these thoughts and I would get gaslighted and say, well, you're the only one thinking like that. The rest of us think this way. And when you come into the community, I feel that we should have a soft place to land for the people. So that's why I give a lot of credit to the clergy project. Because again, you know, if you're in ministry and you have your master's in divinity and your doctorate in theology, this is what you train to be. And once you start having those contradictory thoughts, where do you go? Who do you talk to? Something is wrong with me. <laughs> and, and what happens is I feel that it's important that we have, you know, different types of resources available to people. And that's one of the reasons why I continue on with the podcast and putting that out there because I want people to know you are not alone. You definitely are not alone in all of this. And it's a growing process, it's a learning process, it's always improvement, always room for improvement. And it's important that people do understand that. So while I'm out here and I'm working with a number of different social justice groups, I tell people, if you're gonna work with these organizations, you wanna work with people who are kind to you, people who celebrate you, people who understand that you're a human being and you have issues as well. And there are times when you will not be able to show up and understand that you're not obligated to do so. But if they're mistreating you, then you don't need to be with that organization because they're treat taking you for granted and treating you badly. And so that right there is one of the things that I do challenge these organizations about, about the treatment of other people, but specifically the treatment of people who donate to you and volunteer. And I consider volunteering your time as a donation as well. And so I tell people, I caution them, if the organization you're working for or working through, if the only thing that they are focused on is putting butts in seats and making money, then you need to question what's happening there. And you need to be vocal about it. And so I just think it's you know, important to know that um, over the years, I've gotten a couple of donations from a couple of you know, organizations. Um, whenever I do talks, I t take the honorarium and I have them make it out to charities of my choice. And so at the end of the year, what I'll do is take those totals and put it together and what I'll do is add money to it. So this past Christmas, even though I don't necessarily celebrate the holiday, um, with donations given to me by Third Universal Unitarian Church, Freedom From Religion Foundation, and Chicago Ethical Society, I was able to buy 30 Christmas presents for children in need through this program through a, one, a wonderful woman named Dorothy Holmes. Her son was basically killed by state-sanctioned violence in Chicago. And so part of her healing is going out to the communities and going to communities and schools that are disadvantaged. And so I sent 30 presents to her, and right now I'm trying to help her open up a community center in Chicago. It's kind of difficult because I no longer live in a city. They're gonna need things. The upper part of the center is going to have housing, and it will be housing for women that are homeless and homeless families. So they're still working on that. It's still being renovated and constructed, but it's on its way. And I feel that we, as humanists, should be willing to do that, be willing to help the communities that are in dire need at this time. And so it's been really interesting since November of 2016. And <laughs> you know, with me, I'll, I'll tell you some facts about me. I have a real problem dealing with death. And so as a humanist, I've been working on that, trying to find the language trying to find 
that healing and how to deal with these things. And so it was interesting because when Michael Jackson died, I almost got saved again. You know, that was one thing. And when 45 gave his acceptance speech at the RNC, the people on Facebook thought I was kidding, but I said, I think I need to find Jesus again. You know, and I was asking everybody for a number to a prayer line because that, that's what I was feeling. And what happened was, instead of quoting scriptures, I started quoting Dumbledore from Harry Potter, you know. <laughs> you know, dark times lie ahead of us, and there will be a time when we must choose between what is easy and what is right. And that is absolutely correct because this is what's been happening. I feel like I am strapped in a roller coaster and can't get out and I have no choice but to be on that roller coaster and just take you know whatever is thrown at me but what made it even more interesting is my life and what's been happening in my world now I'm blindfolded on a roller coaster trying to figure out what's happening and what's going on and I'll be the first to say that I resent being forced to participate in a reality show yeah. You know, I don't like this at all. <laughs> and so we know things are getting better. And so I just wanted to make sure that I tell people to be encouraged. Be encouraged. Stay encouraged. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I see, you know, again, we're not out of the darkness. You know, there are still obstructions there, there's still injustice there, there's still violence there. But I see people more willing to fight now. They're more willing to fight. And what I find amazing is what took place in the March for Our Lives. And so initially what happened in Parkland, you know, of course, it concerned all of us. But what had some of us upset was that the black and brown activists and organizers that have been out there doing the work did not get a groundswell of support. They didn't get the resources that they need, needed. They were just told basically sit back and wait for these people to die until Charlottesville happened. And Donald Trump is always talking about he feels like people should throw him a parade Well, Charlottesville had three. So, you know, I feel that he should be happy because he did get the parade that he wanted because, you know, it was some very fine people on both sides, right? <laughs> so, you know, you take it where you can get it. And so what's been happening is I must give credit when it's due to those young people out of Parkland because what they did, and I know this for a fact, that they reached out to activists and organizers of color all over the country. And what they did is, again, as I st stated before, what you saw during that march and you know, even before and subsequent is that is intersectionality in action. That is how you do it. And that's why I'm telling the older people, watch, learn from these children. This is how you push that particular agenda around. And what's so interesting was when Rick Santorum told them maybe they should learn CPR, you know, there's not enough CPR to bring somebody back from the dead. Maybe we need to get Benny Hinn in. <laughs> you know, the only thing that's going to really need CPR is his political career if people take it out on him the way that they should. And so what's happening is this whole swath of children from Parkland, one thing I must say is that they do acknowledge that the recognition they received was because they were white. And they even further recognized that the attention and the support they received was because they were affluent. So that takes me back. I'm part of Black Lives Matter. And you know, I talk about this often. There would be times in which we would be out there protesting for a white person who was killed by state violence. And it would be more black and brown people than white people. And we never understood why. And I would always bring that to people's attention because it's important for you to understand. But when these young people acknowledge that a lot of their support came because they were wealthy, that was a big step. That was a big step. They were acknowledging white supremacy and how it was relegated in this country. And they were honoring, or not necessarily say honoring, but they were honoring people of color by letting us know 
that they understood that they had white privilege and what comes with that. And so what they're doing, even now, you know, um, they've been having some talks with people about their manifesto, but these young folks are open-minded, they are taking direction, and they're including everyone. And so I was so proud, you know, um, that marches went on all around the world with the exception of Iceland, but you never know, it may have been two people out there marching. We just, <laughs> we just don't have a photos of them yet. But, you know, the fact that they had that much impact and, you know, they included a number of people. And what's interesting is when you come into these different communities, you'll hear them talking about diversity, how they want more people of color within their ranks or within their membership or what have you, that's fine. You know, the only time it kind of becomes a problem is when you have a diversity panel and it's all white men. <laughs> and sometimes they would throw a white woman in for fun. <laughs> you know, but you have no people of color, no black, brown folks there. And so after some criticisms, a few of them took our friendly advice and what they did is they would add people of color, black, brown people to their panel, but these were people that had no issue parroting the talking points of the organization. All right, diversity is not equal to inclusion. However, when you only utilize people that, that will parrot your particular talking points, that's not inclusion, that's called tokenism. And you should want people who challenge you. You should want people who critique what you're doing and what you're saying. It's only gonna make you better. But unfortunately, there are a lot of people that do not want to face the privileges that they have in this life. And so this is why you have many speakers of color, many black speakers, myself, and you know, I've said this on numerous occasions that I didn't want to be invited to these all white conferences to talk about race. Because while James Baldwin was correct in saying that white people are caught up in a history that they do not know and do not understand, it's not just white people, you know, it's all of us. And one thing as a humanist, what it did was it encouraged me to go back. And when I say go back, I'm talking about going back in history. If you had all of these social movements, what happened? If you have all of these laws and policies on a book, what happened? How did that come about? And so that's what I do. I challenge people to go back and understand the history, understand the people, understand the times. And no, it's not easy. And again, you know, many people don't want to face that they have privilege, they don't want to talk about white supremacy and all of these things, but we have to have these conversations. And you know, the other day I was talking to someone, we were talking about capitalism, and they were like, well, capitalism is a good thing, it's a great thing, that's what makes America strong, and what's made it a great country. And I'm like, no, that was called slavery. <laughs> And I try to explain to them with capitalism as it's practiced in this country is tied by the hip to racism. So we're not really going to be able to solve a lot of these problems um, with racism without examining wealth inequality and addressing the issues behind that. And when I say capitalism, I'm talking more so along the lines of racialized capitalism which is pretty much all capitalism in this country in a way that is set up. But it's important that um, you know, we have these talks and we talk to one another and again, be kind and allow people to say whatever it is that they have to say. We may not agree, but I'm sure that there is something that we can be agreeable about at some point in time. And so we just marked the 50th year of remembrance for Martin Luther King Jr. And Martin Luther King believed that a multiracial working class movement was required to overcome the failings of capitalism. And I agree. But I want you all to pay attention to what's happening. You have Dr. William Barber out of North Carolina with his Moral Mondays. Um, in different places have Mondays, other days have two other country, I mean other counties and churches have Tuesdays, what have you. But it started a movement. 
And so now they're readdressing the Poor People's Campaign, the very campaign that got Martin Luther King assassinated. And the reason for that was that what happened was with that movement, Martin Luther King was able to talk to white people, particularly working class whites and poor whites. And they were joining up with him because now he's addressing something that everybody could understand, wealth inequality. And you know, having your voice heard, having people understand that, no, you don't understand what's happening in my world. You know, being poor is not fun. But also being poor is expensive, you know, which basically relegates them to a life, I won't say of poverty, but it won't be a life of comfort or luxury either. And so, you know, what's interesting about that is that I believe if Martin Luther King Jr. was alive right now, he would be proud of what's happening all across this country. And even though we had some reservations initially about the activism that came from Parkland, we, we applaud them because again, they included people in there. But the black and brown activists and organizers that were out here, they were taking the hits. You know, they were being arrested. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with it, but the FBI has now created this black identity extremist list. Mm -hmm. And you have activists and organizers being targeted. There have been a lot of killings, you know, people being murdered or suicided, if you will. And this is what's happening. Take a look at what happened to a lot of the activists and organizers in Ferguson, mysteriously coming up dead. You know, people being arrested, the young man that started the Huey Newton Gun Club in Texas and went out marching with the other NRA people, well, mysteriously, he got rounded up and arrested as well for things that took place years before that had been resolved. So I just want you guys, it's, it's important that you understand the context, you understand what's happening out here. So the black and brown activists that have been out here, they were being discouraged, they were being vilified. Many of them lost their employment, you know, losing their apartments and their homes. We won't even talk about what's happening to black trans people, black trans women specifically in this country. I believe the average age that a black trans woman lives is 35. But we're seeing daily, on a daily basis, about trans women, particularly black trans women, being murdered in the streets. And the people who murder them get off scot-free, or basically no sentence at all. It's a slap on a wrist. And so